So, hi everyone, thank you for watching. Today I'm with John Pittman, professional boxing trainer and owner of the Fight Factory Gym in Gloucester. John has uh, trained many professional athletes to uh, a very high level and today we are going to be having a chat about his life and career. So, uh, John, thank you for taking the time to have a chat with me, mate. I do appreciate that. Uh, yeah, no problem. My pleasure, my pleasure. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose um, the best place to start with this is, is at the beginning. Um, I mean, in the very beginning, how did you actually get into coaching? Um, where did it actually start for you? Um, I, I boxed as a, as a young kid. I had a decent amateur career. Um, then I had a motorbike accident when I was uh, 19, 20. Uh, so that was the end of my, um, my, my boxing. Um, and I sort of turned me back on the sport, really, because I couldn't, it just done my head in. Like, I, I sort of dedicated my whole life to it, and it was, boxing was sort of, I'd lived and breathed it. And um, when I couldn't box anymore, I think I was partly burnt out as well, where I trained, I, you know, I used to be fanatical about training, and um, I just had absolutely lived it for sort of 10 years. Um, didn't really address injuries properly, and... When, when I got injured, I should have sort of maybe took a year and a half out, got myself better and and then carried on. But I just sort of, um, I went right off the rails. Um, got involved in uh, like cocaine abuse and you name it. You know, I was sort of, you know, there in the thick of it really. Um, working on the doors and everything that went with that. And... Um, it sort of happened by chance because I was doing a lot of like weight training, um, you know, looked all right on the outside, but not at all fit, you know, just look, you know, my body was really unfit from, you know, sort of smoking and taking drugs and, and just partying really. So, um, we were, we were in a weight gym and a couple of uh, friends who I was training with, we just started doing a bit of pad work. And, um, so I was doing pads for them. And then, just by chance, a friend of mine had, had a unit, and he, and he had, a, he had this um, back room sectioned off, and there was a little boxing ring in there and a couple of bags. And he asked me if I wanted to rent it. So I sort of just said, yeah, I rented it down. I thought, you know, maybe I could earn a few quid just by, um, you know, doing, a, doing pads for people, that type of thing. So within a month of, of renting this back room, I've taken on the whole unit. And at the time, um, this was like 11 years ago now, in Gloucester, there was Gloucester Boxing Club, which is really well established and, um, you know, has had a lot of success over the years. But Gloucester Boxing Club was probably the only, only really amateur boxing club in the area that, that was still going. All the other ones had closed down and faded away or whatever. So there was nowhere to go. I thought there's nowhere to go. If you just want to go and hit a bag, um, you know, because back, back then boxing clubs were more like, if you're not going to actually box, they didn't want you in there. You know, it was all about amateur boxing and they had the, there wasn't people going in for fitness or anything like that. It was, it was either you're here to box or, or we don't want you. So I thought, you know, there's a, there's a sort of gap here for people who, who want to do a bit of punch bag. We want to, you want to train, but maybe don't want to, box don't want to get hit so that's why I, I started up this unit was just somewhere for people to go and hit a bag but that sort of just developed into people coming in and actually wanting to box and then we got affiliated to England boxing and was quite lucky really because because I boxed and I was still sort of known to the officials they allowed me to go on a coaching course because if you weren't affiliated to a club, you shouldn't really be allowed on a course. But thankfully, they sort of let me on, and we started up. Um, we started up our amateur club. Um, I started with another um, local uh, boxer, Nigel Purcell, and um, so we, we got our club off the off the ground. And then we sort of went our separate ways. He got a, he got um, better premises. And um, we were sort of maybe thinking about running um, two clubs of the same name 
in two different locations. But I sort of decided that it was better for me to, to go on my own. And, you know, he was happy to go off on his own. So um, that's what I did. I just started from scratch again on my own. Uh, started my own club, which was called the Factory ABC. Couldn't call it Fight Factory because the amateur boxing didn't like the word fight. So we had to call it the Factory. Um, so that's what we did. Um, you know, we started with a couple of amateur, you know, getting a couple of lads carded and it just grew really like crazy, really fast. So, um, you know, one of the first, I, I started going into a few schools and doing a bit of uh, a bit of teaching boxing in schools and that. And Max Mudway was one of the first kids I taught in school. He was about 11 or 12 years old then. So we start getting a bit of uh, momentum in the boxing club, start getting a few, um, you know, decent wins and, you know, start getting sort of um, established on the circuit a little bit. And then um, Danny Carter, who previously boxed for Vikings in Gloucester, he started training in the gym and he, he was, you know, we were talking about him going pro and I said to him, like, you know, you've got nothing to lose, why don't you just give it a shot and see how far you can go? But there have been no um, professional boxing in Gloucester for probably 30 years since, like, the times of um, Johnny Malfa, Johnny Williamson and uh, Mark Purcell, people like that. Um, so it, it, pro boxing was sort of long gone. Um, it's mainly a rugby city, Gloucester is, and anything else don't really get a look in. So I went to the, um, applied to the British Boxing Board and got my pro license. And me and Danny Carter started um, getting on the circuit. And then you know they brought a, Keith Mayo brought a show to Gloucester, and it was it went crazy for for the pro boxing and. In the meantime, I had some decent young kids coming through in the gym, like Max Mudway and, and Riddy. Um, and it, it just sort of grew and grew, really. That's a, that's a good insight into the, you know, into the history. And obviously, John, I mean, over that time, you know, you've, um, you know, you've had a lot of success with the amateurs, with the pros, with, with, with all different things. I mean, is there um, something that sticks out to you as like your proudest moment so far as a coach? Uh, maybe there's not just one, maybe there's a few, I, I don't know. But is there, is there anything that sort of comes to mind like that? Yeah, um, it, you know, Riddy's achievements are, are, are second to none, really. You know, what what Riddy's achieved and, um, you know, he's had a real tough time. You know, I can remember him walking in the first day he walked in the gym and, you know, he, he was um, just a little street kid, really. You know, he, he was, um, he, he, you could see our talent straight away, but... Um, he just needed to sort of have, have it um, channeled, really. And, and seeing him go through his amateur career and then win the English title when, you know, we, I can remember we went to um, Sunderland and he fought on the pitch at the Stadium of Light. And as we're going out, out the tunnel, um, I think the, the, the guy from the boxing board gave Glenn Foot the English title belt. And he said to him, I'll just give us it back after. And um, I don't know why he had to give it back, but it was almost like they gave us no chance at all. You know, and, you know, nobody, nobody sort of like thought really could do what he's done. You know, people have been writing him off his whole life. And um, especially, and, you know, Reddy's one of them people who, who do, he's not, um, he doesn't do things in a normal way. You know, I can remember reading about like Prince Nazim and he would train at these weird times and do stuff that you just shouldn't be able to get away with. That's really all over, you know, and the way Reddy was, people were saying to me, he's never going to amount to nothing and he will, he'll get to a certain level, but he's not English title level and this, that and the other. And I knew right from the start that he had more than that. And I also knew how to get in not get into his head because I didn't have to get into his head but you can't treat every boxer the same you've got to know what makes him tick and you've got to know how to get the best out of him and that's you know it's all right you know you need to know your boxing but you need if you don't know how your boxer ticks and how to get the best from them you can't treat everybody the same and I believe that I knew how to get the best out of Riddy and I was obviously right because of what he's done but um 
I think winning the IBF European title against Dara Foley was probably like my proudest moment. And obviously watching my son, you know, um, come through, uh, he walked into the gym with his hands over his ears when he was like two years old, you know, and he, he's just been brought up in a gym. He didn't know any different. Watching him grow into a decent boxer and, you know, he won the Bristol Box Cup and stuff like that is obviously, you know, very close to me because he, because he's my son. But, you know, the lads, what I've, I've, I've not got lads that have just joined, you know, like you take on pro fighters, you know, so a pro fighter comes to me and says, oh, you know, can I, can I train with you? Then, you know, you, you, you do your best for them, but it's not the same as the ones like Max, like really, obviously my son, who you've had from scratch. You know, you've seen them grow from little kids into, into adults and, and you've been through them um, the whole way, really. You know, they become like family. So definitely rid his IBF. And also when he won the World Youth title as well in Gloucester, that was a massive night. I can remember walking out to the, um, on the ring entrance and like you got to really sort of... Um, compose yourself as a coach you know because if I don't get my job right and I give him the wrong instructions then I ain't doing my job properly so you know you've got to ignore all the noise of the crowd and all the faces and you know it's not just Riddy's family my family are all there and it's a, it's quite um quite a moment really when you know you, you walk out in front of your own city and you know, I think he sold 30 grand's worth of tickets for that fight. So it, it, it was like, you know, you got to, like, get your head together and, and hold it down now. So, yeah, that was that was quite a moment as well. Amazing moments there. And it's, it's amazing to hear about him, obviously, from from your point of view. You, you touched on something earlier, John, that, uh, that I wanted to sort of go back to. You, you know, you touched about, um, you know, what makes what makes fighters tick and, and, you know, how you've got to understand that and everything like that. Um, personally, I feel that the, 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 the mental game of boxing isn't always um, discussed as much, you know, as, as like the physical side, basically, is, is what I'm saying. Um, I mean, with that in mind, what sort of um, mental aspects do you think are like important for people competing, you know, at the highest level, basically, if that makes sense? The one thing that I think above everything is they have got to believe in themselves. Because you, you get some, some fighters who have got all the talent in the world, but for some reason they've got doubts in their mind and whatever. And with, you know, with Riddy, for instance, Riddy's been telling me since he was 14 years old, I'm going to be a British champion. I'm going to be a world champion. And at first, you know, you just think like, it's not cocky, it's confidence. He's always had confidence. And people who don't know him would, would maybe see it as cocky, but it's like, He's always believed in himself, no matter what. And, you know, the, that is the one thing I think is really important. Um, and, and the toughness as well. Like, I've seen him spar with some, you know, household names, so many world champions. And I've seen, I've seen really have a tough time in those spars. And we've come away from, like, match room in, in um, Essex. And, um, we've you know, we have a chat on the way back about how it all went. And, you know, like, if he's at the wrong end of it, he can't wait to get back up there and put it right. You know, and, and I think that that takes um, a special kind of person who you don't see, oh, you know, the kid was too good for me or whatever. He'll spend the whole week thinking, right, how can I put that right? And how can I adjust? And people don't give him credit for how, how intelligent he is, you know. And I think to have a good boxing brain and to believe in yourself but you definitely in pro boxing, the toughness is a big thing because it is such an art sport. You know, people, unless you see it up close, you, know, you see it on telly and, you know, you see what goes on. But if it, when you live it and breathe it and you're, you're uh, working with fighters day in, day out, you see what they got to go through from the diet into the training to the, the physical contact. It is such a tough sport and um, it is not for everybody. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that people, you know, particularly the fans and people like that, they just, they just don't see. And it's funny because when, when I interviewed um, Rizzy recently, which you saw, we were talking about that, and he was uh, telling me about some of the spas and how he looks to adapt and how he, you know, he picks up these different tricks and he's like, oh, I want to learn how to do that. And it was, um, yeah, it was fantastic to talk about that that mindset. But um, going back, going back to yourself there, John. I mean, one thing I wanted to ask you is, obviously, in this way, you're like almost like a father figure, you know, to, to um, some of these boys, you know, from a certain perspective, and you've seen them grow up and, and all that. What sort of atmosphere do you look to create in the gym? Uh, I mean, what I mean by that is you go in some gyms and they're quite formal and they're quite sort of like that. You go in other gyms and, it, you know, there's a music playing and it's, it's more relaxed. And there's, you know, there's a banter going on. And I mean, what sort of environment do you try and create uh, in your gym to, for the fighters to work in? I like to, there's a lot of banter in the gym, there's a lot of music in the gym, it's quite light-hearted. When the training camp's on, it's different, you know, once the, once the training camp's on and, you know, lads have got dates, everything changes. You know, there's still banter, but, you know, to put them through what they got to go through, um, you can't really mess around with it. But my gym, not just for the fighters, but for the people, everybody comes here we've got such a range of people diverse um, from a social spectrum of people that come here and um, I can believe I can remember like a lot of boxing gyms were always places where they were quite intimidating and you know if, if people didn't know you they wouldn't talk to you it's a lot it's not like that here you know like everyone speaks to everybody there's so many people that come to my gym that everyone's got a different trade Every, you know there's police there's criminals there's Free everybody in between and there's a big sign on the front door of my gym that says leave your ego at the door and that's what people do they they leave whatever they are whoever they are they leave their they, they leave their shit at the door and they come in here and they and everybody ups everybody um when fight camps on then obviously we'll have closed sessions where it's you know it's down to business but um I think, you know, you've got to have a laugh with, the, with, with everybody to get through what it is because, you know, with, with especially the pro boxing, it's, it's just such a tough sport that, you, you, you know, you have, to, you have to have a good sense of humour to, to, carry, to carry it through. So, you know, the gym's buzzing all the time, really. There's all sorts going on, all sorts of different people here. Um, the better amateur lads and the pro lads will train together. So... I think that that creates a good um, atmosphere for some of the the better amateur lads coming through. You know, they they want to do what Riddy's doing, what Max is doing, um, and and training with them only only helps and brings them on. And I think as well, it helps. You know, sometimes it's not all about hard sparring. You know, we got some good amateurs who are technically really good. You know, and and it's good for people like Riddy and Max to spar where. It is more technical, and they ain't got to worry too much about power and stuff like that. And and some of the, some of the amateur kids, you know, like my lad, for instance, you know, he he'll spar with Riddy now. He's only fourteen, but if Riddy switches off, he, he's he's going to get nailed, you know. And it, they everyone helps each other. But having having someone like Riddy, Max Mudway, in the gym, it it really makes everyone else feed off it. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes, it's a good it's a good insight into it. And the other thing um, with that, John, I, I wanted to sort of touch on is um, Riddy, and, uh, and I know, you know, we, we've talked a bit about him, but it's, it's, it's one other thing I wanted to touch on there. Obviously, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know, people have um, written him off and said he wouldn't do this, that, and the other, and he's gone and done it. And, and he's, you know, moved into very high-level fights um, quickly, but, um, but obviously he's, he's always pulled it off. I mean, was that something that was sort of your vision, his vision, the two of you together. I mean, how, how did it come off or, you know, how does it sort of go down um, when you're planning this? You're like, like going for the European, for example, you said, that, um, um, yeah. With, with Riddy, Riddy's got a clear plan with what he wants to do. Sometimes I might have to say to him that you need to take his little step back a bit, but you know, yeah, you know, I'm Riddy's coach, but we're friends as well. And it's more than friends, you know, we, Riddy's like family. So, I want to make sure that he makes the right decisions for him. Um, it's not about me, it's about Riddy. So the decisions that are made are made in his best interests. So if Riddy says to me, 
oh, I want to, I want to fight this guy and start calling this guy out. And I don't think it's right. I'll tell him and I'll tell him the reasons why I think that. And uh, most of the time, he'll listen if, if he disagrees with me then you know he'll tell me why he disagrees with me but um we make decisions as a team you know obviously with mtk you know that as well but like there's certain pitch you know the only fight that that i thought this is where he's really up against it was chris jenkins um i knew that he'd be I knew that he would beat Glenn Foot because just I just knew his style would, was wrong for Glenn Foot. Um, Freddie Kewitt, um, you know that was someone else really wasn't meant to beat, and and you know I, I was confident that he could beat him. With Chris Jenkins, I knew um, that we're really going to see what you're made of this time. And you know obviously the cut happened, but I think really was t- was taking um, control of the fight anyway, um, in my opinion. Um, you know, the scorecards will, will obviously reflect that as well. Um, Darryl Foley looked to me like he shouldn't, he, he was just not even on the same level. You know, it, it was, that was a really easy fight for Riddy. Um, but, you know, we, we talk all the time about where it's going and, and who, 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 who we want to, what path we want to go down and this, that and the other. But it is difficult because there's no clear, oh, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. Things change all the time in boxing, you know. And um, one, one minute you think you're fighting this guy, next minute someone's injured and no, you're fighting this guy. And, you know, you just got to play it by ear a lot of the time. But I do believe that you're in this sport to, to, to achieve something. So um, when... Um, when we were trying to match Riddy for the WBC when he fought Chris Jenkins, we were really struggling to get him on an opponent. And we were, we were bringing up guys or managers, you know, and these guys were like 10 and 0, 12 and 0. They didn't want to know, you know, so what are you in it for? If you don't want to take a chance, you know, we, we, we we've took chances with Freddie Kewitt. That was a chance, Glenn Foot, you know, but you, you see these opportunities and you've got to take them. You know, and there is some risk involved, but I don't believe that if you lose a fight, it's the end of the world. You know, as as long as you know you can you can learn something from it. I think there should be more fighters fighting 50-50 fights, and and there should be more fighters taking prepared to take risks. Um, I'm not sure whether it's the managers, the promoters who, who don't want them to take risks, or the fighters, whether it affect ticket sales if they lose. But, um, you know, Ridd has always been there to um, take up a challenge. If, if he got offered a world title fight two years ago, he would have been, he would have wanted to take it, you know, and I would have said to him, look, you ain't ready for that. But um, you do, you know, I think, you, you know, you're in this sport to, to, to progress and get as far as you can. You're only going to get as far as you can if you're prepared to, um, to put it all on the line. I like the mindset. I, I do. I like them. I and I agree. To be honest, even though it's a little bit off topic, I've um, often said the same thing for you know for a long time. Now, there's one other thing um, I was going to touch on here, John, which was um, basically advice for uh, for young fighters. Now, obviously, I don't want to give too much um, away here because obviously, you know, people want that. They should come to the gym, and that's fine. But just as an overview, you know, if you had to give. Um, one, two, three pieces of, of advice for somebody who wants to succeed in the sport that are, you know, absolutely essential. Um, what would they, like, what would they be, basically? Um, basically, you've got to train, like, you know, you've got to put the work in. Don't cut corners. You know, do your training. And, and also, do your research on where you're going to train. You know, look at, look at um, you know, what the coaches have done, what their backgrounds are. Um, what they've won, who they've coached. Um, look at, you know, you, you just got to be sure that the coaches have got the interest of the boxer. And, and that's the most important thing because there's no point having a brave coach in your corner who, who's not got your best interest. And, you know, there are some coaches out there who, who, are, who are really in it for, for their reflected glory. Think. Do your research on who's going to coach you. Make sure that that you're prepared to 
do the right training, um, eat the right food and, and make the sacrifices to, um, to be in the best possible physical shape and, and just be prepared for it not to be easy. You know, like you have ups, you have downs, you know, you take a loss. It's not, especially in amateurs, a loss is not always a bad thing. You know, as long as you keep, um, keep learning and um, keep moving forward and keep believing in yourself, but just give yourself the best possible chance of winning by doing the right training. That's good, that's good advice. It's very good advice. I would like to touch on, um, uh, you know, what, a couple more things now. And one of them is obviously your own motivation, because one of the things is obviously um, to be a coach and obviously to do what you do, you have to be very, very dedicated as well. I and mean, that goes without saying. But if you had to sort of pick something that um, obviously motivates you to, you know, keep performing at this level for, you know, as, as many years as it's been. Um, I mean, what, what motivates you to do what you do, basically? I mean, that, fundamentally, that's, that's actually, you know, what I'm asking. I know it's more than just a job. Um, uh, so... I think the, the main thing is, is I absolutely love what I do. Um, I, can't, I don't like going to sleep. I, I just want to come to work. Um, I've got an amazing wife who I've got, you know, she supports me all the way. She's a massive part of the gym herself. So that makes it a lot easier. But I really want to see the, you know, the lads that I train that um, I really want it bad for them. You know, I, I want to see really achieve everything that he can. Um, I want to see Max and, and all the rest of them, Kyle, Leon, Jay. You know, I really want to see all of these lads be the best that they can be. Um, and I just get a massive kick out of being around them and, and being around the gym. I just, I love the sport. 99% um, of the people that I've met in pro boxing I've, I've, I've become friends. Um, you know, this, there, there's people that I, I sort of um, used to watch on the telly uh, that have become friends. Um, I just love everything about boxing. Like, I love the sport. I love the training. I love seeing the lads win. You know, and, and as much as you love seeing them win, when you, when you take the losses, you feel the losses as well. Um, you feel, you just go through such a roller coaster thing and, I'm not somebody who can, um, there's a saying, the devil plays with idle hands and I need to be doing something like all the time because if I don't, then I can get myself into trouble. So um, I, the, the gym and, and boxing, it, it just, it keeps me on the straight and narrow. Um, I'm in a position where I feel that I can help other people get um, even if it's not the actual fighters, there's a, there's a lot of people who, who come here that um, have got shit going on in their lives, whether their marriage is breaking up or whatever it is, this seems to be somewhere where people gravitate to, to sort of like, it's almost like a therapy type place. So um, it just motivates, I just love being here. Like I'm here all the time and luckily, you know, my wife works at the gym as well. Um, but I just I can't get enough of it, you know. And, and boxing just is is just my old life, really. Well, that's that's something. I mean, uh, it's, you know, you, you've got to love what you do in life. I, you know, I've always said that. And I suppose there's only there's only a couple more things now, one or two more things. And um, one of those is obviously um, future plans. Really, I mean, one of them is is obviously. I mean, now you know when the lockdown lifts and and when things are. I mean, obviously things are slowly getting back to normal. But uh, even even further ahead, even over the next couple of years and stuff like that, um, thinking thinking ahead. I mean, what are some of your future plans now? Well, there's so, some big stuff happening that I can't really go into at the moment because this is right in the early stages. But I read a lot of like um, motivational stuff and um, stuff on that successful people have done, what they've done with their lives and that, and. Um, I, wrote, I read a quote that said something like, um, out of struggle, there's always opportunity. And I really believe that. And I think out of this pandemic, there, there is going to be opportunities for people to really do well, whether in whatever field you're in. And we've got, we've got something big that we're sort of in the early stages of at the moment, which hopefully is going to take the gym to a completely different level. 
Um, so that's that's one thing that I've got my mind on. Um, and, and also really just to see how far we can, the lads are going to go. Uh, hopefully we'll have new fighters coming through, whether it's from scratch or whether it's, you know, other pro fighters who decide that they want to... Um, they want to come and train here. Um, it's just, it's an exciting time really because, you know, Rid is really on the, on the verge of making it big. Um, and I've, I've seen him, I've seen him mix it with the, the absolute elite in the world. And I can tell you now that he can hold his own with anybody. So it'd be interesting to see how far that journey goes. I just, just plan on enjoying my, my, time here like you know and um enjoying training the lads being in the gym being around boxing um not just my you know my lads as well i enjoy you know like the lads at st joe's you know and seeing how well they're doing and you know gavin reese's boys and people like that it's not it's not just about you know the lads on training it's about the wider thing as well you know you become friends with people and you know you're buzzing off them doing well as well makes a lot of sense and there's one more thing, John, that I'm gonna gonna touch on. It's um, yeah, a little bit different than you know what we've talked about so far. But you're sort of quite well known, or I'd say a bit famous, really. I mean, you know, you've got some seriously cool ink. You know, you know where I'm going with this. You've got yeah. some. I mean, some of that, the Mike Tyson one, and um, some of the stuff that's going on there. I mean, you know, um, what's like the inspiration, you know, behind some of that? Well, Tyson was always like my idol. Um, he was just like. Oh, I just like Nigel Ben and Tyson were I used to just watch hours and hours and hours and hours of, of them and try and you know replicate what they did stuff like that and I got a chance to meet Tyson um, at a function in London and I was sort of like a bit um, I was a bit worried about it because I thought oh, if he turns out to be an asshole you know I, I, I don't want to sort of I don't want to ruin my perception of him like and um so me and my wife went to meet him and I shook his hand and I, I sort of pulled my, um, my sort of T-shirt up and, and said, oh, can you sign that? And um, he, he just, as soon as he saw my tattoo, he was like all over me, like hugging me and kissing me and like, oh, I'm never going to forget you, man. And it was just like the most surreal moment of my life. You know, it, it, it was just like, he was just such a wicked person and it, it just sort of absolutely made, made my day. It was like, I always say it was one of the best days of my life. You know, like, forget my kids being born. Like, that was like a horror film. Like, that, like obviously I love my kids the best, but watching them being born is like not ugh, nasty. But meeting Tyson was just amazing. It was just, um, so he, he signed my tattoo and I went straight to... Um, a guy I know who's a tattooist, <clears throat> and um, he went straight over it and, and tattooed his signature on, on, on the portrait. Brilliant. That is yeah. amazing. If I ever get skin, I can cut my arm off and sell it. <coughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant. Well, you know, John, I mean, that's, to be honest, that's, that's everything, really. I mean, we, we, we've covered a lot there. Um, before like, I wrap this up, is there anything in particular you know, that you'd like to say to people watching at all, or are you all good? like that um just keep your eyes out for like we've got we're doing live live fitness classes um through facebook live you can download our fight factory app and if you know if you're training at home and you want to you want to sort of um be pushed and all that you, you know you can jump on our, our live fitness classes if you're not sure how to um go about that just message me on facebook but apart from that really it's just you know looking forward to getting out of this lockdown properly and getting everyone back in the gym and getting back up to, um, you know, St. Joe's and um, Gavin Reese's and getting some decent sparring and getting, just getting the lads back out fighting, really. Brilliant. Well, John, I mean, thank you very much um, for your time, mate. I appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with me today. I, I really do. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.